This episode of the Answer is Yes Baja Sessions is brought to you by Baja Bound Insurance Services. Driving to Mexico? You can buy and print out your Mexican auto insurance policy online in minutes with their easy-to-use website. They also have great travel information to help you plan your trip south of the border. Visit BajaBound.com. Hello, this is Ryan Thomas, and you're listening to the Baja Sessions. Over the last three decades, I've lived, worked, and played from the top to the tip of the majestic peninsula of Baja, California. And because of this, I've met some incredibly interesting people with equally interesting stories. And today on the Baja Sessions, we're going to chat with one of them. Well, Chip Connolly, I am honored to have you on the Baja Sessions today. Uh, as we were discussing before... Uh, before I press record here, I, I kind of didn't feel worthy to have somebody of your stature on this show, but uh, the link is Baja, and I will say that uh, um, my life and the things around Baja have, have opened doors for me to make friends with and have access to people that I otherwise would not have. So uh, I, I'm blaming Baja on the ability or on my ability to get a hold of you and get you to agree to be on my show, and I, I'm sorry if I sound starstruck, but I guess to a degree yeah. maybe I am. I'm honored. Listen, uh, I, I, anybody who's who's in love with Baja is a good friend of mine, and anything we can do to help uh, both make the place better and um, but also help people to know it exists is a good thing. Yeah, just not too many people, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the good news about Baja, generally speaking, but you know, the whole peninsula uh, it, it, is it it's the least populated part of Mexico, so. Um, that that's there are parts of it, Tijuana, uh, Cabo, La Paz, that are you know have a lot of people in them. But generally speaking, um, there's a lot of land. Yeah, there's all you got to do is fly at, at a at a low altitude over it, or even from thirty thousand feet, and you see there's a lot of land for sure. Um, you know, I, I'd like to give you the opportunity. Uh, I'm I'm going to tee up a couple of things, um, but I I I know that you have a pretty um, extensive background, and uh, this this show is is definitely we weave Baja through it. But Baja, like I said, opens up doors for me, and and somehow has been a link to some very interesting people in my life. And I categorize you as one of those people. Um, your entrepreneurial entrepreneurial role in starting um, is it Joie de Vivre? Is that am I saying that the right exactly, way? Exactly, you got it perfectly. Um, and I'm going to use my, my Spanish to somewhat translate that. Is that joy of life? It is. <laughs> but it's French, correct? It is, exactly. Okay, gotcha. Um, can you tell us, tell the listeners just a little bit about what Joie de Vivre is and uh, how it started? Sure. So I, um, at age 26, I decided I was a commercial real estate developer in San Francisco working for uh, <clears throat> a maverick uh, company based in, in the city. And uh, I decided I wanted to become a hotelier. And so I started this boutique hotel company. Um, this is back in 1986, 1987. Um, and boutique hotels were just starting to get off the ground in the United States. And um, so I was sort of, a, I guess, a, a bit of a pioneer in the boutique hotel movement. <clears throat> I took a, a broken down motel in a bad neighborhood in San Francisco in the Tenderloin, turned it into the Phoenix Hotel, a rock and roll hotel. And 33 years later, it's still there. And over the course of the next 24 years, I... Uh, created 52 boutique hotels, um, all of them in California, most of them, 46 of them in Northern California. And um, we became the second largest boutique hotelier in the U.S. Uh, and then I sold the company in the Great Recession to a guy named John Pritzker, whose father started Hyatt. Oh, wow. So exit, exit from, from business, and now you're fully retired, living the good life. Well, not exactly. So here's what, what happened along the way is so, so it, it was interesting. I loved my company and grew it from one person to 3,500 people. And but the, you know to have both the dot com bust uh, and since we were a Silicon Valley in San Francisco and Bay Area firm, the dot com bust hit us pretty hard. To have that and the Great Recession in the in the same decade gave me this sense of like, okay, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. Yeah. And um, I sold the company at the Great Recession, the bottom of the Great Recession, and I wasn't sure what was going to be next for me. And I spent a couple of years. I wrote a book and um, started a, a website based upon the world's best festivals. But um, about two years after I sold the company, I got a call. Um, 
seven years ago from the three founders of Airbnb. And to be honest with you, I didn't really even know what Airbnb was back then. And it's amazing how quickly these things happen. And um, they wanted, they were a tiny little tech startup that really wanted to become a mainstream hospitality brand. And they wanted me to be the in-house mentor to Brian, uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO. So I said yes, and it became a huge part of my life for the next four years. Um, and and then for the last three years, I've been a, just an, a strategic advisor to them. But that process of spending four years taking a little tech startup and turning it into a, a global hospitality brand taught me a lot about what it means to be an old guy in a young person's business because I was 52 when they – approached me and the average age in the company was half that age. And um, I realized pretty quickly that I had no background at all in technology and never worked in a tech company. So I was both the mentor and the intern at the same time. And that's what led me to writing this book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. And I got to say, that's the part that that Chip intrigued me so much. And as I said earlier, um, I'm I'm not... uh... I'm staring 50 in the face, and it's coming faster than I could have ever imagined. Uh, I'm 47, but I've always felt like an old soul and identified with older people. My dad passed away at 62, which I would consider fairly young by today's standards. Um, And uh, as the listeners know, I I moved to Southern Baja um, in 2000, and... At that point in time, living in, in San Jose, there, there weren't – and I was 27, I think, 27 or 28. And um, there weren't a lot of young couples, stable, normal – and there was plenty of young people that were there living the wildlife. But the majority of our friends, um, after living there for a couple of years, were tended to be older. In fact, we were at a party one time, and we were all kind of joking about how Amy, my wife, and I were the youngest. And uh, – we kind of took a poll of the age and then divided it by the number of people there. And the average age at this party was, you know, 60 something. There were some 80 year old Mm -hmm. people. Um, But I found that, and and so did my wife, that we became friends with older people um, quicker than we became friends with younger people. And then coupled with, again, the, uh, the, the late parenthood we, we uh, had, I had, my wife had our son when I was 41 years old. I'm 47 today and he's six. We're now all of a sudden immersed in this school culture where there's kids whose parents could actually be our kids, <laughs> and mm-hmm. it just seems mm-hmm. so odd. And uh, I still think I'm cool. I still think I mean, I'm fairly fit and healthy, but I'm clearly not as connected to the 28 and 29 year old culture or or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, generation, Mm -hmm. as I think that I am. And and every day there's more and more examples. So um, I became intrigued with with, um, some of the things I heard you speaking about and and, um, then your sense of peace with this position that you're in today in, in life. And that is one of obviously not knowing a lot of things about where the world currently is, but having a, a, a very um, colored past with lots of experiences that do make you valuable. And I'd love to hear m- more about that. You, you've you got a, an equation, event plus reaction equals outcome. And mm. um, I, I identify with that as well. Can you explain to the listeners kind of what you mean by that and, and how that how your experience now as what I'm going to assume you re- you refer to yourself as a modern elder? How does a modern elder deal with that equation? Well, I, I think, you know, there's a famous book, one of my favorite books ever written by a guy named Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. And he's a psychologist who was in a concentration camp in World War II. And he was able to show that actually people had a sense of meaning. Um, if they had a sense of meaning or a sense of hope, they actually lived longer. It had nothing to do with whether they were frail or not. It had a lot to do with their sense of what was what they were feeling inside of themselves. So that equation you just talked about, it speaks a lot to the fact that how you, you know, whatever event happens, whatever circumstance happens, so much of it has to do with how you respond versus react. And Frankl has an amazing three sentences in his book where he says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is your power to choose your response. And in your response lies your growth and your freedom. And so in, in some ways, the I think the difference between 
a young person uh, and someone older is often the difference between reacting into life versus responding to life. Wow. And reacting to life tends to be in the moment. It's, you know, we know with our kids, um, it's, it, it, they, they can go from, you know, smiles to tears within a second. Um, and, and the truth is, I think as we get older, we get a little more moderate and tempered in our emotions. Sometimes that means we get you know, distanced from them, and that's not necessarily a good thing. But the idea of moving to a place of responsiveness as opposed to reactiveness is means that with the world's circumstances and, and events don't have as as much of a catalytic, catalytic effect on you so that you're just sort of on this emotional roller coaster. And we all know what that's like. Our teen years are very much like that. Even our 20s can be. But as we get older, we start to moderate. And the key is, I think, to be, yes, it's great to moderate your emotions, but to still be passionate about life and to still be engaged. Um, and so to, to me, being a modern elder is being as curious as you are wise and being reflective on life, but also being, being engaged. And I think if you can be all of that in one person, um, you know, you are, you're more valuable in the world. So as you were um, uncovering these mysteries or, or, or learning these components of aging, um, that was taking place within the context of, of working at Airbnb or with. Yeah. 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 In fact, you started calling me the elder there and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I, I, I'm not elderly. And they said, no, you're the elder. Elderly is different. And so what I started to realize is, is that elderly is generally maybe the last five to 10 years of your life. And it's often a time when you're actually very reliant on other people and you're a little bit, you know, um, not as independent. And, and yet elder doesn't have anything to do with the last five or 10 years of your life. Elder is a relative term. If you are, as I was, 52, surrounded by 26-year-olds uh, who are two generations younger than me, yes, I was an elder. But the thing that they started to say is you're a modern elder. The, the, the elder of the past was regarded with reverence, but a modern elder is appreciated for their relevance. And the difference between reverence and relevance is reverence is almost obligatory, but relevance is is what pe why people will actually lean in and want to listen to you. It's earned, yeah. It's, yeah, you earn it, and you, you earn it from by two things. Having the wisdom, but if you don't have context for your wisdom, if you're just spouting out about the past and what you've learned, but you actually can't make it relevant to young people uh, or understand the context. So for me at Airbnb, I was a longtime boutique hotelier, but you know, home sharing and Airbnb was a tech company. So it's like a t different model. It didn't really matter how many maids a, 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 a rooms a maid cleans in an eight hour shift in the home sharing world. So some of my knowledge didn't matter much, but if I could actually create some context for my knowledge and wisdom, then all of a sudden it mattered. And that's what I think is really important as people get older and the world seems to, the power seems to be going to younger people faster than ever before. You need to actually be open to being a learner and being curious about life because if you just sort of spout knowledge or wisdom or experience from the past without giving it context, a lot of younger people don't know what to do with it. So that, I think, you know, yes, at Airbnb, I, I had a huge impact on a lot of younger people partly because I created some context for my knowledge and wisdom. The... Um... There's another quote that I read of yours, and, and this resonates with me because I, I'm realizing as, as someone who is fit and, and willing to do anything in work, um, and currently that, that can entail stacking tires if the need arises, um, I, uh, I also struggle with the context of how we ultimately pay a lot of people, and that's by the hour. And um, you you have a quote that says maybe it's time we get a toolbox that doesn't just count what's easily counted, the tangible in life, but actually counts what we most value, the things that are intangible. And I listened or or read a part of your book where you kind of went into the discussing of you know how how is it that we try to to use time to ultimately. Um, put a value on what we contribute in the workplace versus 
some of the intangible things that we contribute in the workplace.